Welcome to the Sanity Project Podcast, where you can awaken your mind to clarity and success even in today's life challenges. We're here to provide insights and solutions that will help you live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Here is your host, Joanne Victoria. Hello, everybody. This is Joanne Victoria with another amazing episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. You are here to discover a life of clarity, confidence, sanity, and entrepreneurial success. Our guest today is Terry Short. Terry is the author of The Words We Choose, Your Guide to How and Why Words Matter. And I love words. Terry Short is a human potential developer who has more than 30 years of leadership experience, a master's in business administration slash healthcare management, and her professional coach certification. Through coaching and speaking, Terry has inspired countless staff, senior leaders, physicians, and middle managers to connect to their why and to harness the power of empathy and personal relationships. Welcome to the podcast, Terry Short. Thanks, Joanne. I'm really thrilled to be here today. I am grateful that you are here as well. So tell us about how you get to the place where you are writing a book on the words we choose and why words matter. How did you get here? Well, it was a very long journey, I will tell you. And uh, well worth it. Well worth every step. So first, I'd tell you that I believe instead of uh, climbing a ladder in my career, it was more of a jungle gym approach. And early on, I was a leader um, in hospitality, particularly four seasons for quite some time. And when that was the case, I found myself always concerned about how we spoke to our our customers, our clients, and our guests. And it really made a difference. You know, I'd hear, I'd hear a bellman or I'd hear a, a, a server say something. And there, there were different things that they would say that would tip me off. And I, I would just sort of register it. And I found myself coaching. I've been a leadership coach for quite some time. And then advanced several years. And I find myself as a leader in healthcare. And next thing you know, I'm paying attention to the words we choose when we're talking to patients. And that was a whole different ballgame. You know, it's Mm -hmm. really different gauging what you're saying to, uh, in my case, the Four Seasons, sort of the rich and famous. And then now I'm I'm helping people speak more appropriately to those who are in a very, very vulnerable place. So put that all together with my leadership development, my coaching, and I thought, there's a book in here. And that's what led me to write the book. Well, that is very interesting. I mean, people don't realize how important hospitality is and how important language is when you're in hospitality. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that there's years ago, I was familiar with a member of the National Speakers Association from San Francisco who came from hospitality and people don't, you know, how do you define hospitality in the uh, hotel venue and it's difficult to you know okay fine you say hello you say goodbye here's your room it's it's way beyond that it's really heightened customer service right and then when you're dealing with people who are in a hospital that is just sad i don't care if you're in there for minor things the energy around a hospital is not supportive at least your hotels were were pretty (laughs) You know, you don't get that too much. So I'm sure you had a lot of data to focus on to write the words we choose, your guide to how and why words matter. Mm -hmm. I sure did. You know, when I think about the hospitality, one of the examples that comes to mind is probably about 15, maybe even 20 years ago now, in particularly in hospitality, people started saying, no problem about everything. So I would order, you know, I'd ring down to the front desk and ask for an additional pillow and the person would say, no problem. And I would think to myself when I hung up, well, I didn't expect it to be. Right. (laughs) You know, now you're offering that uh, potentially it was and and, uh, you're going to solve for that. And so it just was, a, but not only that, but it's a double negative, right? I'm hearing no, I'm hearing problem. So I'm hearing not double negative in a grammatical standpoint, perspective, but I'm hearing two negative things that that now the person has offered to me. I was in the, you know, the positive place. 
And of course, when the person arrives with the pillows, it's the same sort of thing. And instead of saying, it was my pleasure, you know, they're coming from a place of um, being of service is what hospitality is founded on, but it ends up, so is healthcare, so is leadership, so so is motherhood. (laughs) You know, the the list is endless. So if we're going to be of service to others, we should be choosing our words wisely. I totally agree. I um, When I interview people such as we are doing today uh, for the podcast, I'm as conscious as I can be, but sometimes I have one of these utterances that may not be correct and not there's nothing bad about it. It's just not best. You know, it's not the best it can be or the best that I can be. Mm-hmm. So how... Uh, you have here, you'll, change, you'll share how changing words can change perspective and how we approach the world. How does that work with leadership? Because that's really one of your fortes, yes? Absolutely. Well, I'm going to use a, a couple of my, I'm going to lead with my 2020 example. Everyone spent 2020 using the word if. Well, if we travel again, if we return to the office if we're able to do this, if we ever take our masks off. And think about how deflating that is. It's, um, it undermines the idea that you will do any of those things. Changing that out with when is much more uplifting, much more um, affirmative, much more possible. So it's very simple. And, and I like to say, Joanne, is that you can't unsee the list. I had a, had a rather large list of the words leaders should remove from their lexicon uh, posted in Fast Company mm-hmm. magazine. And I, I, that, that's a very comprehensive list. And I like to say you can't unsee it. So the listeners will think, oh, that's it. I should remove if and use when. But the list is rather long and you can't change all those things at once, right? Well, you shouldn't. It'll be a burden instead of something that ben- feels beneficial to you. That's correct. That's correct. One of the others that um, I, I believe may have come to the forefront more during the pandemic is the word but. But, but, but. You know, oh, we could I don't do like it. that word. <laughs> That's right. Because why don't we like that word? Because it truncates. It severs, it's the scissors, whereas the word end would be the glue, would be what, what pulls the two thoughts together. And it's really as simple as that. Whatever comes before the butt is severed or truncated right before anything else is said. And then it, it separates what else is said in the second half of that conversation, right? Or that thought. Yeah, where, yes. right? yeah I had read similar uh, statements uh, quite a while ago that anything before the but is is el- eliminated from your mind or eliminated from the reader's mind. So I try to use however, comma, however, you know, that is less, it depends on the sentence or the, mm-hmm. you know, the complexity of the sentence. But when people, but, <laughs> and, <laughs> when, and when people use the word quote unquote, but it just eliminates your mostly your high point. Correct. You know, funny thing about however, um, I was a however user as well. And I mean, I and I mean, until recently, I didn't, um, I did not by any means in the book say, you know, that however wasn't a good, uh, I don't remember dealing with however in any way, shape or form. I went right from but to end and it talking about the value of that and, and having end be something that was much more affirmative and continue, continue to, continuing of the conversation. I had somebody say to me uh, recently, the thing about however is that it's but in a tuxedo. Ah. <laughs> right? Okay. All yeah. right. I can see that. Mm-hmm. So, so challenging oneself to go to end, and it's not easy. I hear myself, like you just did, I'll say but, or I'll about to say but. I'm just, it's, it's rolling off my tongue. And I'll consider how the conversation or the, the thought changes if I, or when I insert end. And I'm telling you, 95% of the time, it's appropriate. It's an extender. It's a, it's a um, uplifting part of whatever came first, even if it's bad news. So here's, let me give you an example. 
if you're a leader and you have to do a reduction in force or some sort of change up to processes or something. So it's something that has to happen that will be perceived as negative. And, and uh, so someone says that to me, let's say a leader above me says that, and I'm now in turn telling the rest of the team, I might be inclined to say, um, uh, well, you know, we're going to have to eliminate two of these positions, um, but we'll each pick up some slack and so on and so forth. But if, if I change that and I say, there'll be some changes to the to our headcount and to the number of people on our team, and what we're looking at doing is... And I turn that around to something that it already will be perceived as more positive. Except for the two people who will lose their job. We, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps that was a bad example. <laughs> but, but and they're going, about- is it me? Is it me? <laughs> Pointing to themselves. Right. I see, I, no, I see how it's more powerful. And that's, I think, with... In a sufficient downtime, people can learn to use, obviously, by purchasing your book. That's a great benefit. But people with with downtime that we've been having over the last, whatever, 18 months, it's probably mm-hmm. longer than that. Mm-hmm. March, was it mid-March 2020 till now? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that this this is doable. People need to have better language. You know, and I think but one of the things I think happens is, um, you know, this generational stuff, you know, how people how, I don't can't define all of the generation, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of them don't even know words. <laughs> Can I say that without sounding bad? They don't use their use your words, you know, is a good statement. But when you right. find people just using emojis to communicate on their phone, how, you know, and, and they're old enough to know better, in my opinion, how, how do you handle that? Mm, that's a great question. I dedicated an entire chapter to that. <laughs> oh, good. I'm asking yeah. the right questions, people. Right. right. So I did a chapter about, well, email, text, social media, other ways in which we communicate and therefore may be misunderstood. And so there's some statistics in there about the how we've truncated, there's that word again, truncated what we intend to say by limiting first, let's say, um, Twitter, or even the amount of words you'd put on um, Instagram. I, w- I want to say Facebook as well, but people really get carried away. So it's, it's not as limiting. But in that, in that the act of limiting we lose part of the message, right? Or and sometimes we actually lose part of the word. Yes. <laughs> LMK. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Let me know. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let me know. And I, you know, these are things that I learned from my 20 somethings. I yes. got it. Right. So yes, so I speak about not just the how these choices of emojis and the abbreviated words can limit us, but even the choice to send an email instead of picking up the phone or walking into someone's office when we're able to do that again. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and also texting. And I provide some guidelines on um the thought process of what, which is appropriate. And in the business world, you know, people use Slack a lot. So what instant messaging in any form, when is that appropriate as opposed to email, as opposed to the telephone call, what's the value or lack of value for using each of those? So yeah, I believe one has to start there and, 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 a, and commit to some parameters and perhaps as a company or as a team commit to some parameters, or I like to call them protocols. And then from there, you're in a position, once you've chosen which is the appropriate medium, then you're in a position to pay more attention to your word use therein. And when you were talking before about, um, you know, perhaps in these 20 months, we have had have the ability to slow down and pay more attention to, to our words, I propose we slow down on a daily basis, mm-hmm. do what I call practice the pause. 
And really, before something comes out of your mouth, you practice the pause. Now, Joanne, I come by this naturally because I am a very fast talker. <laughs> you know, I can, can go at the a mile a minute. And so learning to practice the pause before something came out of my mouth has been a real challenge for me. And when I think now about the value of that, and the value is connecting what's in my head, which might be going at a mile a minute, with what's in my heart, my intention and my values, and how I'm going to indeed connect those two together for what comes out of my mouth. When I fully understand that, I say, hmm, you better slow down. Yeah, the pause. Think before you speak, people. All of us need to do that. Think before you speak. So if we're talking about leadership, which is a specialty of yours, mm-hmm. How do you help the leaders who may not be 20 or 25 and, and, and have relationships with, you know, LMKs, et cetera, uh, texts? <laughs> How, well, you know, it That's happens right. out there. I mean, not every leader is going to be 25. So yeah. when you have a leader who is 45, for example, or even older, how do they communicate with people who, you know, are stuck to their phones. I mean, you know, I, I always, when I'm dealing with a group myself, I have them shut their phones off. And if they don't, they can leave the room. Um, and I've been doing this for years. You know, I've had people come into my sessions, you know, group sessions or a workshop with their laptops and they're not hearing me. <laughs> There's no way they could hear me if they're writing what I'm saying. You know, so I have asked again, please don't use your laptop. And if they are unwilling to do that, they get a refund and you can go home now. All right. So how do you handle that today? Well, I want to tie back to one of the words that's in the name of your podcast, that word clarity. Yes. So it's all about clarity. So if I'm a leader in today's world, I want to bring clarity and I want to I want to open up the ability for others to bring clarity. So I'm going to operate in a space, and this is what I suggest to others, where that's top of mind. So when someone's speaking in in abbreviations and emojis and this and that, I'll call that out, you know, and I encourage my clients to that you're you're in the business of seeking clarity where the world goes round when we are more clear with each other, right? <laughs> so so Ask for that. Seek the clarity and then coach those that are not um, operating from that same standard. Coach them from the perspective of clarity, right? So why? If I'm the younger person, why are you asking me to do it this way? Why are you asking me to uh, remove my computer or not abbreviate or not say this on Slack or so on and so forth? And if we hold on to clarity as a value, then we can lead back to that, that it's where we will all be served better and, and uh, be able to communicate better on a higher level if there's more clarity. And there's more clarity when we do these things. So that's what I would tie it back to and, and have a very candid, authentic conversation about it. That is, the, I have found, that is one of the true benefits of the younger generations is that they desire the feedback. They want to know where they stand at all times. They want authenticity. And that means that they have to accept the clarity that comes back to them so that they're able to um, communicate at a higher level. Yep. Cool. So what about um, using words that I know we used, however, and, and, but, so how can we elevate um, ourselves and our conversations by the choice of words? Yeah, well, I'd love to talk a little bit about how, where it starts. And it starts with elevating oneself without before we are communicating with others. And I like to call that your personal podcast. You know, so people are walking around with their head bud, or, uh, earbuds. <laughs> they are head buds. <laughs> right, they are. <laughs> Their earbuds and they're, you know, listening to podcasts all day, hopefully yours. And, and as well, when that when other voice isn't playing, their internal voice is playing, right? So whether or not that's the voice of your mother or the voice of your boss or, you know, whomever 
you invite on because for your personal podcast, you are the the producer, the director, the narrator, the host, all those things, right? And you have the ability to choose. So you choose, you choose. The voice is a choice that plays in your head. And that's that's step one is take control of that voice and then choose the appropriate words for that voice. So for example, when I was younger, I grew up in Maryland actually, and I would say when I moved to California, I would say that I I came from the world of the shoulds because the narrative playing in my head all the time was that I should. I should do, you know, I shouldn't wear white before. I might get these rules wrong. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with you. I came from the East Coast myself to California and I had lots of shoulds. Right. Should I think it shouldn't wear white before Memorial Day and, you know, whatever, open-toed shoes. That, that's just sort of a fashion and things, but there were lots of shoulds that governed my world. And even in the corporate world, um, as I was younger and getting into the corporate world, there were a lot of shoulds. And I allowed the, that narrative, the shoulds, to take over. And it inhibited me. It prevented me from making good decisions and from opening myself up to opportunities. And so I, I stifled the shoulds. And I recommend that to people. And you replace should with I will, I can, I'm capable of. So that's one of, that's an example of how you change that narrative. As soon as you hear it pop in, as soon as you hear some of these limiting words pop in. Who knew that should was a limiting word? I just knew that it was like negative, you know, it's like should, what does that mean? What does that mean? You know, what, who told you you should or had to? And those things just, you know, coming from the East Coast myself, it, you know, when I, I came from the East Coast to California, I had to stop wearing gloves. So, <laughs> I mean, I would wear gloves to go grocery shopping. That's what one did. And in the East yep. Coast, you know, it's very, it's very old there, uh, yeah. almost archaic, but very old. And I don't mean in age so much, but there's this steadfastness that there are rules. Mm -hmm. And when I came to the land of California where rules didn't even know the word rules, (laughs) it was a shock, let me tell you. Yes. Yes. And I bet you left your two-inch Emily Post book behind as well. (laughs) Probably. Probably. I probably have a brain drain on that one, but probably. Mm -hmm. But it was... You know, there were certain things that you did. You always covered your legs. You always, so many stupid, stupid things. I look back at that now and I go, oh my God, what people do to harm our well-being. Right. And I believe those types of things are prerequisite to using the word just. So we we use the word just so many times in a minimizing way. Um. In healthcare, I would hear, uh, let's say, I have an example that I recall as a dietitian saying to a patient, I'm just the dietitian and I'm here to do such and such. Well, what's going through my mind is that they're responsible for that patient's nutrition. And until the patient has the right nutrition and things are progressing with their bodily functions, they're not leaving the hospital. <laughs> so that dietitian is a key part of helping the patient heal and get get on the road to recovery by way of the nutrition that they're providing. There's no need for the word just. There's no need to minimize or limit saying, I am the dietitian and therefore responsible for your nutrition is much more affirmative. You've, I'm sure you... Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to say, I totally agree with you. I have a problem with the word just, you know, just give me a minute. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it sounds diminishing, right. um, but it's, what does it mean? And people use it all the time. Uh, I know if I, I don't think I do it in my writing. Um, I don't think I use the word just in my writing. Um, and if I do, I take it out, you know, if it comes out automatically, because I'll sometimes do automatic writing, or a lot of times, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a, see, there it is. It's just a word that I have. It's it's, what does it mean? It's a limiting word. Yeah, it's a limiting word. Even if you're giving a presentation, and and I oftentimes I'll hear clients say, well, 
um, you know, I, I told my boss that I just want to review how we're tracking to goals and such. Well, wait a minute. You've just minimized the effort and, and how you, how the importance of what you want to explain to them. Right. By qualifying it with the word just. And it's, there is no need for it. It should be eliminated from my perspective. There, how many times have I set, seen executive assistants that are holding an entire office with maybe two, three executives together, and they'll say on the telephone, well, I'm just the administrative assistant. And I think to myself, that bubble that go, is above their head right now is saying, and absolutely nobody would get to their meetings on time or complete their uh, follow-up actions or, you know, what have you, if I wasn't right there supporting them. That's what's really the bubble in their head. Yes, <laughs> so and they why, won't accept their power. Yeah, they move so away from their it? power. Yeah, yeah. So for anyone who wants to learn more about the words you choose, go buy the book, The Words We Choose, Your Guide to How and Why Words Matter. And where can they find the book, Terry? Um, You can find it on all the retail outlets. Um, You can find more information at shortgroupnot.net, including the first chapter. You may download the first chapter for free, and that gives you some insight into um, what it's all about. Yeah, I like when uh, authors do that now. Um, I've seen a lot of it recently. I'm sure it's been going on, but I've seen a lot of that recently, most recently, where people are offering. I had one person who was not only offering the first chapter um, to read, they're offering the first chapter in audio, which I thought was really empowering for the audience. So um, is that where you want people to go to find out more about you, Terry, as shortgroup.net? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of good things there. Lots happening. Good. Well, I want to thank Terry Short for being here today. Remember, Terry is the author of The Words We Choose, Your Guide to How and Why Words Matter. And to me, this is important. And for those of you who listen over and over and over again, uh, listen to this podcast over and over and over again, at least once more. And take notes, please, by hand, because it's the best thing to get to your brain. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And thank you, Terry Short, for being here with us. Thank you, Joanne. It was great fun. Thank you. Bye, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sanity Project podcast. Please go to AskJoanneVictoria.com to listen to more podcasts. Check out Joanne's coaching programs and get a free copy of her report, Five Steps to Achieve Life-Work Harmony. That's AskJoanneVictoria.com. Take care and thanks for being here.